Hi, grade 12 biologist, Mr. Kleiman here. We're starting a new unit. It's called homeostasis. And homeostasis is talking about maintaining an internal balance. An internal balance of what? Well, I'm sure that you already know that you keep quite a few things balanced inside. For example, things like your blood sugar levels. You're going to maintain your water and salt balance. Uh, you're going to maintain things like your calcium levels, uh, your levels of hormones. Uh, other things that you're going to keep in balance too are things like your body temperature, right? You know that you're always 37 degrees Celsius. And so when I'm talking about homeostasis, I like to think of things kind of like these toys. Now conventional diagrams I find tend to show us like a teeter-totter or some kind of like a conventional balance. And I don't love those analogies for thinking about homeostasis because when I think of those, if I put weight on one side, well it tips and it stays tipped. There's no self-writing mechanism on a teeter-totter. But what's beautiful about living things is that they're self-writing, that these internal mechanisms are kind of around some balancing point. And when we push them out of balance, as you can see the hand periodically does to this toy over here, they tend towards returning to that same balanced point all by themselves. Uh, and so let's see how your body can achieve this with some of its internal factors. Okay, and again, it's kind of like you can think of it like this little egg toy uh, where any kind of push is going to ultimately result in it returning to homeostasis. But the harder the push, the more we get it out of balance, the longer it's going to take to reachieve that balance. This is what homeostasis is all about, okay, staying within that narrow range of tolerance. And so in a living system, it kind of goes along this type of feedback loop. We need a couple of words to describe what's happening. The first thing is that there's going to be some kind of a stimulus, and this is a change in the environment. And not every stimulus is something that matters to you. In the room right now, there's all kinds of, let's say, radio waves and signals coming from cell phones and radio towers, and they're changing all the time, but I don't notice them and I don't respond to them. There's changes in the UV light, okay, tons of things all around you all the time. So it's not enough just that there's something changing the environment. You need some kind of mechanism to detect that change. You need sensors. And so that's things like nerves and nerve endings in your skin. Um, once you get those signals, you know, my nerve endings aren't smart enough to know what to do with it. We need to have some kind of a, a central processing unit that can gather that information from your sensors and decide what is the right way to respond to those stimuli. And so that's where integrators come into play. And of course, in you and me, that's primarily in our brains and in our spinal cords is where we make those decisions. Uh, and then you need something to do the response, right? You need what we call an effector. If you were, you've touched something super hot, well, you've got uh, sensors in your skin that know it's hot. You've got your brain to say hot is bad and will burn you. And then your brain will tell your muscles, pull that hand away. So in this scenario, the muscles would be the effectors, which is something that can allow you to respond. And then, of course, that's going to produce a response. And here's where that self-writing comes in. Uh, very often in biological systems, that response is going to feed back directly to reducing the stimulus. We call this negative feedback. So again, with me touching that hot stove, uh, if, if that was the stimulus, the response of pulling my hand away from the stove is going to make me not touching the hot thing anymore. I'm reducing that stimulus. Uh, we call that negative feedback. And so here it is diagrammed out uh, the way that you might see it in a textbook. And you can see that balance analogy uh, being the sort of teeter-totter on this thin point, uh, which I don't love, but it works. If there's some kind of an imbalance, we can detect it with a receptor. We can then understand what the receptor is saying with our control center or our integrator. The control center or integrator can then tell our effectors what to do, and they will respond and return us back to homeostasis. Okay, uh, Here it is diagrammed out in another way that really highlights that negative feedback, that the effector is going to ultimately reduce the stimulus until we return to balance. And if we apply that to something like body temperature, your body should be at 37 degrees Celsius. 
But if your temperature starts to rise, well, those sensors in your skin and in your brain are going to detect that your body temperature has risen. It's going to understand that that's not good for you, and it's going to start telling your body to sweat. And when you start to sweat, it's going to cool you back down to 37 degrees Celsius, negative feedback. And we know that even non-living systems can do this. Uh, my house right now is about 23 degrees Celsius, and that's because I have this really simple system set up. If I go anywhere above 23 degrees Celsius, okay, there is a sensor inside of my thermostat that detects it. And the thermostat then sends an electrical signal to my basement where my heater is. And it's going to say, hey heater, it's too hot, turn off. Uh, we're going to cool back down to 23 degrees Celsius. And it's going to keep decreasing until we get to, let's say, 22 degrees Celsius. And now that sensor says, oh, too cold. Thermostat says, turn that heater back on, and we're going to go back up to 23. And then if we get above 23, we'll turn it off. We're going to be constantly doing this game of turning that furnace on and off until we're staying in that sweet spot, exactly 23 degrees Celsius. And all you needed to maintain that perfect temperature is a sensor, a really simple mechanism to detect what the right temperature is, and it can tell that furnace, the effector, whether it should be on or it should be off. Okay, and we can really keep the house at a very, very specific temperature, at least relative to where that sensor is placed. And so that's kind of what it looks like, right? It's that up and down, and we're kind of always uh, teetering around this fixed regulatory point, some programmed normal or healthy condition. Okay, and again, that's kind of like the center of gravity on this toy. It's always going to tend back towards that one fixed and steady point. And so your skin is an incredibly complicated place. Many of you might have just thought of it as a barrier to the world, or maybe you didn't think about it at all. But if you looked underneath your skin, you'll see that it's actually got two layers. There's the epidermis, the outer skin, and then there's the dermis. And in that dermis, it is completely packed full of nerves. This is your sensory system. And you can detect things like cold and hot, and you can detect things like pain and light touch versus strong touch, which is a little bit deeper. Uh, there's nerve endings at the end of each one of your hairs, okay, which can detect the movement in those hairs. And how are they detecting this? They're not particularly intelligent at all. What they have is ion channels in the cell membranes of these nerve endings. And you know sometimes they'll have a binding site for, let's say, chemicals, and that will change their 3D shape and let ions in. And when ions go in, it creates a change in the electrical potential inside of that cell. And that can trigger a whole wave of electricity to go from that sensor to your brain and say, something's happening here. And, you know, a signal molecule, maybe that's a hormone or something in your blood. That's not quite what we're seeing here. Uh, this could be simply an ion channel that changes 3D shape due to temperature. Or it could be one that changes due to pH. So if you break the surrounding cells, suddenly uh, those ion channels open and you know, hey, there's something, the pH is off. I must, there must be broken cells nearby. Uh, or even just mechanical movement. A shift this way opens up that protein channel down goes the signal okay so this is a it's very it's simplicity but each one of these um, sensors themselves doesn't know what to do with that information and just because one or two sensors is a bit cold doesn't mean that you should start shivering okay so you need a brain and so you really here's the the whole thing mapped out for that that temperature scenario again with a little bit more detail if you go above that 37 degrees Celsius, the brain is going to signal your skin's blood vessels okay, to dilate. That means get bigger. Uh, that's going to tell your sweat glands to turn on and that can cool you back off. Um, but what if you then cool below 37 degrees Celsius? Yeah, well, it depends how severely you get cooled. 
So if you cool a little bit, then we're going to say, hey, stop vasodilating, start to vasoconstrict, get, make those blood vessels a little smaller so we have less blood at the surface, we're letting less heat out, uh, and turn off those sweat glands, right? Turn them off. And hopefully that's enough to bring us back to 37 degrees. But if it's really, really cold out, let's say, maybe that's not enough and our body continues to cool, and maybe at some new threshold of cold, it's going to be a new response from that integrator, that control center, our brain, and it's going to say this temperature warrants more response. This temperature warrants involuntary muscle contraction, right? Shivering, and that muscle contraction is going to generate body heat and hopefully bring you back up to 37 degrees Celsius. So we kind of have this range of tolerance that we can handle to keep us within 37 degrees Celsius. And within that range of tolerance, we have like a whole repertoire of different types of responses we can try. Uh, and some of these are really complicated. And this is even a pretty gross oversimplification of all the different ways that your body responds to changes in temperature. Where you can upregulate and downregulate your metabolism. Uh, there's stuff called brown fat that you can use to heat up. There's, there's a million different, different things that you can do. Okay. Um, it's not all negative feedback, though. Sometimes we get what's called positive feedback where the response actually increases the stimulus. And it's a little more rare because that kind of brings things almost out of control. They go up and up and up and up. Um, but it's functional for some uh, situations like the one you see here. Uh, here you can see a woman giving birth. And so when this baby is big enough, uh, it turns around and that head now starts to apply a little bit of pressure to the cervix and there's the vagina where the baby is ultimately going to be able to come out and so as this pressure the head of the fetus pushes against the cervix that's going to send a nerve impulse okay, to the brain saying hey there's pressure here and the brain is now going to tell the pituitary gland, hey, there's pressure on the cervix, start releasing oxytocin. This is a protein-based hormone. And as oxytocin builds up in the blood, okay, it's going to make its way, of course, back to the uterus. And when the uterus detects higher levels of oxytocin, it starts to contract. Okay, now the baby still can't get out because the cervix is closed. But what's going to happen? more pressure on the cervix, more signal to the brain, more oxytocin released, more contractions. And this is going to go on and on and on, and contractions are going to get stronger and stronger over a period of several hours until eventually those contractions are exactly strong enough to push out the baby without crushing the baby, we hope. And of course, once the baby is out, the pressure is relieved from the cervix, this nerve impulse stops, the oxytocin levels are free to come back down. But another cool thing to think, like why not have this be a you know direct loop of just nerves? Well, when you do this with chemicals, we're free to sort of make this concentration specific. And we can make these signals happen a little bit slower over the course of minutes or days or hours or months, uh, sometimes even years when we start using hormones rather than electrical signals. So you have these two main systems of response. We're going to study both of them in this unit. One of them is your nervous system, and the other one is your hormones. Um, both of them are super, super important signaling mechanisms for both getting uh, response uh, and for uh, detecting stimuli. Um, and so what we also have to remember is that there's no perfect way to do this and all forms of signal and response are kind of biologically expensive in that when you want to maintain 37 degrees celsius that's going to take quite a bit of energy so not every creature has developed a mechanism for maintaining their perfect body temperature i'll remind you from the beginning of this course uh, proteins need to be within some range of temperature to have the right 3D shape to function. Okay, So creatures benefit from having a, a more constant body temperature, but it costs a lot in the form of energy. So you need to eat a lot to maintain a perfect body temperature. 
a lot of creatures just don't have that luxury. Either they don't have access to enough food, or they just haven't evolutionarily developed a mechanism to change their internal temperature. Think of things like, you know, unicellular creatures or, you know, the simplest ones, bacteria. What are they going to do? They're going to be the exact same temperature as whatever environment they're in. We call those poikilotherms. And a poikilotherm basically is the exact same temperature as whatever it is outside. They cannot and they don't try to change that temperature. And so they have to live in a particular place, generally places where the temperature doesn't change that much. And whatever the temperature is, is the temperature of their body. Okay. The alternative is to do what we do, to be a homeotherm, which means to maintain homeostasis of temperature, stay within a very narrow range, a constant body temperature. And you and I stay within 37 degrees, give or take 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. And when we do that, we can really optimize like every last one of our chemical reactions. Our proteins are all working at their absolute best all the time. Okay, but in order to do that, you eat three times a day. Um, so how do we achieve our, our homeothermy? Well, we use what's called endothermy. We really use our metabolism for the most part uh, to keep us in that perfect, perfect range. And again, that's the energy intensive one. What if you wanted to maintain your body temperature, but you didn't want to spend that much energy. Well, you might be an ectotherm. And that means that you can use the environment to help change and regulate your body temperature. So you're not perfectly being home a homeotherm. You're not exactly a poikilotherm. Your body temperature fluctuates a bit with the environment. But if you're a turtle, you are going to spend the sunny times of the day getting out of the water and onto a rock sunning yourself. You're going to try to absorb heat energy from the sun and get a little bit warmer than it is outside. Okay, uh, maybe you're this kangaroo rat and you're great at regulating your body temperature, but in the hottest part of the day in the desert where you live, it's out of your range of tolerance and you just cannot cool your body enough with sweat or lowered metabolisms. So what do you do as the kangaroo rat? You must, must, must find shade or you're going to die. Okay, we call that ectothermy, where you use the environment to help maintain your body temperature. And of course, there's everything in between. These are all gradients. You can be a little bit poikilothermic and a little bit homeothermic, where you can maintain your body temperature, let's say, during the daytime. But if you're this hummingbird that lives up in the mountaintops, you're not going to be able to do that all night. And so at nighttime, you just let your body temperature cool, cool, cool significantly. It's like going into hibernation every night. We call it nighttime torpor. It's like a daily hibernation. Um, you can be an ectotherm, but you can also for other parts of the day be an endotherm. Okay, so there's this whole spectrum uh, of strategies that creatures use to be energy efficient when they're trying to maintain homeostasis. And so you can see in these two graphs, we've got the ambient temperature outside and we've got their body temperatures inside. And here you can see that the bobcat, whether it's cold or whether it's hot outside, doesn't make a heck of a lot of difference to their internal temperature. They're very much like us, about 37 degrees Celsius. Whereas this snake, if it's cold outside, he's pretty darn cold. And if it's hot outside, it's pretty darn hot. So this snake is kind of a slave to the environment. Might look like poikilothermy to you. But snakes will sun themselves to warm up and will find shade to cool back down. So they're practicing ectothermy to stay as best they can within an optimal range. But their temperature will fluctuate quite a bit throughout the day. The beauty of this strategy for the snake is that it can get away with eating like once a week, some species once a month or every couple of months, uh, whereas this bobcat is going to need to eat every single day, ideally more than once. And you and I, we're eating like three times a day because we're not only maintaining our body temperature, but this brain up here is incredibly hungry for energy as well. So to get access to the kind of calories it takes to be a strict uh, homeothermic endotherm, uh, not a lot of creatures can do that. So there you have it, maintaining that internal balance of homeostasis. 
Uh, in our next video, we're going to look at yet another example of a body system that can accomplish this, uh, this time for regulating not your body temperature, but your water balance. So go check that out. I hope that helps.